It's 2018. I roll up to 5626 Fondren Avenue to coach the first class of the day. It's a, a foggy morning in March. And the workout is 975 of a barbell squat snatch and muscle ups. And so I've premeditated on this workout and what I want to do. I take everyone through a general warm up. I go into a, a specific prep that includes a very thorough progression for the muscle up, for the barbell snatch. I take everyone to the whiteboard and in great detail, I brief and explain how we need to scale this workout. From there, we branch out and I give everyone a moment to independently practice the iterations that I've given them for the workout. And several times I have to further modify and scale the workout for people before we start. Three, two, one, go. And I am wearing my ass out, making my way around the gym. There's seven people out of the class of 25 that I have to further scale so they don't kill themselves. <laughs> and you have to remember that at this point, I'm a, I'm a level four CrossFit coach. That means, ladies and gentlemen, if we're playing Dungeons and Dragons, I'm like a wizard. Okay, I, I not only know all the tricks, I teach these tricks through the level one and level two seminar, and I have for the last 10 years. So back in this class, I am doing everything that I know how to do, that I've been taught, that I have taught others. And we get to the end of the class, there's high fives, there's a celebration, I get several accolades for doing a great job. But I look and I realize that out of a class of 25 people, there are two that have done the workout as it was written. And I can't help but feel like I kind of hate this. <laughs> and I want to explain that to you. That's a strong word. And I don't really mean that. But in that moment, I didn't like that the attention was on me, like it was my job, like I was the hero that they needed to come alongside these nincompoops that couldn't do these movements and try to resurrect them into some version of this workout that will allow them to get to the end. I looked around and I could tell. I could tell by their body language. I could tell by the way they were carrying themselves that everyone besides those two people didn't feel successful. Now, to add insult to injury, the very next day, there was a gentleman by the name of Jerome Bartazzuli. He was from Paris, France. He had gone to SMU on a track and field scholarship. He had since graduated, which means he didn't have access to the SMU strength and conditioning facility, but he was on the French national team for throwing the hammer. Jerome was probably 250 pounds. He could back squat 670 pounds. I saw that with my own eyes. And from a high hang position, he could power snatch 300 pounds. Jerome, by anyone's definition, was incredibly strong. He stumbled into our gym and was using our facilities so he could train for the Olympics. And after several months of getting to know Jerome, he was in there and he had, uh, he had the courage to come up to me and he says, Spencer, why is everyone failing? And I was like, Jerome, what do you, what do you mean? He's like, I look around and I see everyone failing reps. And he wasn't saying that to, to call me out, even though I immediately got defensive. He truly was uh, flabbergasted. He had never been in a functional fitness community where people failed reps. The way that he was taught to strength train is that you never failed anything, which 
which what that communicates is that there is this very, very long progression of development where you're under no illusion that you have to take something to absolute failure for you to progress. And so the combination of those two things, feeling like a failure at the end of coaching a class to the best of my ability, and someone outside of our community bringing it to my attention that potentially the way that we were going about this wasn't the only way to go about it, made me have uh, a real moment of crisis, uh, a moment where I thought, man, is this the best way to go about things? And so today, I want to talk to you about, since then, for the last five years, the way that we have experimented and iterated with taking this thing that is that is so good, taking this thing that is that is so potent and has so many things that is so wonderful and trying to expand that container into something that potentially is safer, into something that we believe is longer lasting and ultimately puts the, the focus on the athlete versus the coach. I'm Spencer Nix. This is BPR where we talk about the art of radical health and athlete design. And as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about ways that we can further customize this group training experience. Now, before we get into the specifics, I want to uh, clarify what I mean by some of these words that I'm throwing out there. I think that you can you can place all training on this continuum. We like continuum, so here's another one. Now, on one end, you have everyone doing exactly the same thing. You could think of this like a boot camp or, uh, hey, like a, a, a spin studio where, by and large, everybody is, to the best of their ability, trying to do the exact same thing the exact same way. Now, on the other end of that continuum, you have things like private training. You have things like uh, individual program design that was made really popular, at least by, by my knowledge, uh, through OPEX. And so what I'm recommending, and I think this is where most people have made the mistake, is that you, you see in group training closer to SoulCycle, Berries, uh, maybe some CrossFit facilities where we try to make everything as homogenous as possible. When someone sees that there's uh, an inconsistency there, I think the tendency is to go way too far in the other direction. And so I have lots of friends, and hey, it was a temptation for me as well that to say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm seeing some limitations here in the way that we're coaching people in the group, as I just described. And so my answer for that is to completely abandon the group and switch to private training or completely abandon the group. And I will not only create a customized program, I'll create a one of one bespoke individualized training program. That's not what I'm advocating here. In fact, I think there's several things that happen in the group that if you dissolve the group, uh, you're missing out on some of the stuff that we talked about last week, the social component. I've been in gyms where it's private training and it's individual program design. And this is just my opinion, but it feels very isolated. It feels very stale. Highest degree of personalization, but very little socialization. And yeah, I, I've heard the response to that. It's like, oh, well, you know, it, it, is, it is social. And I'm sure in lots of ways that it is, but there's a lot of friction there to make it social. That means that uh, in groups where you're cast together and everyone's doing the same thing, the, the best part of that is that it's very easy to be social. There's very little friction. And so what I want to make sure that we're on the same footing as we get into some of these details is something that's right in the middle. Uh, to wax uh, philosophical for you, uh, Aristotle talked about this centuries ago, um, and he, he called it the mean, that the two extremes would be uh, 
you know, way too much of one thing, possibly even a good thing. And his recommendation is like, hey, always go to the middle of the road. Always try to find a compromise. Now, today we would call that something of a hybrid, which is an offspring of these two seemingly um, different categories. And so today I want to get into what a hybrid might look like. How might we continue to foster this group environment, but to think really objectively about what's required for it to be social, what's required to maintain this group cohesion, and then everything else that doesn't fall in line with that, hey, we give ourselves permission to, to modify, change, experiment, and see what works. It's been my experience that in the last five years of doing this, not everyone has to be doing exactly the same thing for there to be a coherent group. And in fact, the only thing that you really need for there to be a group is people doing something at the same time. That's pretty much it. Now, the next thing is uh, talking about the difference between scaling and what I want to lean into is customization. I've heard this conversation brought up, and a lot of times the rebuttal from a functional fitness community is like, oh, hey, we're already doing that. It's called scaling. And I want to push back with that a little bit because, one, there's a lot of gray area when it calls uh, for scaling. Most of the time, and in the example that I gave previously with Amanda, the 975 workout for time, the low-hanging fruit, uh, no pun intended, of how we'll modify this is just to change the shape of an apple. So if this workout is an apple, all we'll do is like try to shrink the size of it, but it still is an apple. We're still going for time. The rep scheme is still descending and it's still variations of these poses and positions that look in some shape or form like a snatch and a muscle up. What I'm advocating is significantly further than just changing the shape of the fruit size. There's probably a better analogy in that, but we'll just go with it. And it is potentially changing the fruit altogether. It's potentially changing the whole container um, that that workout lives in and giving ourselves permission to do so. And so I think there's there's two things that we want to hang our hat on as we move forward. And, and this is the criteria with why we would do it in the first place, is that As I looked at that workout in 2018, um, no one had to have shoulder surgery because of what they did. Not many people were successful, but no one acquired some acute trauma. But I do remember there being several people that commented about how their shoulders didn't feel great. Now, there's a lot of gray area there as well. Not feeling great doesn't mean that they injured themselves. But I'm now sitting at 15 years of doing this. I did the math before we started this episode. That means that it's potentially 5,475 workouts that I've put someone through. And in that singular instance, it's the best job that I can do. And I'm the one that's teaching this stuff at the time. And so I don't like the chances of anyone else having better odds there which means that there's a potential every day for one or two people to be started down the route of pathology and to set a a simpler way. If that's the way that they're going to navigate workouts, I don't like their chances of maintaining it long term. So I do think there's a safety component that we kind of brush away because uh, functional fitness is capable of producing great results. But I would say that sometimes those great results are due to luck versus a really great process that you can hang your hat on and almost demand that everyone gets that response. I think what's not talked about quite as much is uh, not the results that we see in the the fantastic um, potency of functional movements executed at high intensity, but all the people that can't sustain this program and all the people that feel like failures the second they start it and the majority of uh, the human race that actually has a hard time exercising. And so by giving them something that 
potentially is not going to leave them feeling successful, giving them a workout that has a container based on movement patterns that aren't necessary for you to live a healthy life, I think is something that we have to, at this point, um, evaluate and, and not evaluate in the way that we say, man, uh, CrossFit's stupid, because I don't think it's black and white, but to evaluate this thing and think, man, is there a way to evolve this thing that we love? So moving forward, if you're watching this and who this is designed for is the coach in general, potentially the gym owner, someone that is facilitating this versus just the consumer. And so I thought about, man, what are the ways with which we went about this? And these first ways that I'll describe are ones that you can implement tomorrow, ones that you can implement as a facilitator of a group training session, and uh, no one would be the wiser. From there, we'll start to get into more and more um, insidious levels where it would affect the programming. Uh, it, it would affect the way with which um, you'll have to communicate with your athletes about why these changes are present all the way into potentially changing your entire business and the way things are structured. And so let's start with some of the easiest ways possible. Years ago, there was a book called um, By the Numbers. And I don't remember the author's name. Uh, it was a really thick manual. And I thought it was fantastic. It was fantastic because it brought up um, progressions. And progressions are something that I have a deep-seated love for because I think it makes your job as a coach significantly easier. And one of the things that you can do that immediately would start to, to customize this is to think about your warm-up as a way to precondition what someone should do. Because if you're like me, a lot of times when you get up at the whiteboard, you've laid out this elaborate method of scaling and you're, you're doing your best job to communicate to people the bucket that they need to be in. But inevitably, you have that guy that's right on the cusp between those two buckets of beginner, intermediate, advanced that doesn't belong in advanced and kind of winks at you like, yeah, I, I know that you're telling me to be here, but I'm going to go ahead and go there. And I think when you have workouts that are for time uh, and you have – you know, a bunch of human beings that aren't totally secure about what they're doing. And also there's some gray area. You're going to inevitably not find a perfect system there by just relying on your brief of the whiteboard. And so during the warm up, if you can think about those in state movements that you have and reverse engineer what the poses and specific positions are that someone would need to assume, that would be a great way to start your warm up. This can even be the very first thing that you do. And so I'll give you an easy example. Um, if we have a movement that's a bench press, maybe the first thing that we do is think about something that isn't even moving the person, but is just holding them in a position. So your warm-up would start with just a front-leaning rest or a plank hold. From there, maybe you're working on a very, very slow eccentric of that push-up. And all the while, you're looking around and you're evaluating, you're saying this to the people in your, your training session. Hey, I want you to be able to do, and you fill in the blank. You come up with some predetermined uh, assessment criteria that if they can't pass it, it means they don't move forward into the next step. I've done this over the years with everything from bench press to uh, some of the higher skill movements to things with a change of direction, uh, like the Olympic lifts, things that have speed, like box jumps, um, because you got to realize that the you could be doing everything in your power to deliver verbal, visual, tactile cues, but if the client doesn't have the ability to decelerate, they're not going to be able to do anything that you advocate for them because the movement say it's a box jump or something like that, doesn't have the ability for them to stop in midair. And so there's a whole host of these movements that I think are great, and, and we're not going to get into the details of which movements are good and which movements aren't. I think every movement has its time and its place, but there's a lot of movements that we're advocating in these workouts that require 
quite a bit of progression, quite a bit of time to get to the place where you need to be. Here's an easy example, uh, running. In my mind, there's a precondition that someone needs to be able to hold a uh, face down in the GHD for two minutes. They need to be able to do a rear foot elevated split squat for eight reps at 33% of their body weight. And they need to get a long, slow progression of being able to control their body with very little volume before we throw something like repeat 400s at them. And so in this warm-up example, you're dropping people off at certain stages of this progression, and that's where they'll stay for the workout. And so you've already come up with these different movement selections that don't need any further communication at the whiteboard. In my mind, this is something that takes a few minutes of prep time ahead, but with some easy communication, by the time that you actually get to the workout, you're going to see different people doing different movements with validation for why. Because sometimes at the whiteboard, what's going through their head is, ah, you know what, that's not me. He's, he's saying that, that someone who's intermediate needs to be here, but I, I know that's not really where I am. Yet with this objective criteria, there's no wiggle room to say if you're uh, capable of doing this or you're not. You just experience the, the precursor to that movement and you know where you should be. So that's one. Uh, secondly, I think with just a little bit further clarification with some of these workouts, you can start to regulate the intensity. You can start to be a little bit more specific with what you want to get out of there. Now, this is something that has been around for a long time, but I think just recently it's become very popular. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is rate of perceived exertion. So this is something that was developed for energy system training uh, with correlates to breath rate, heart rate, and it's a way to advocate certain levels of subjective intensity. And so having a 20-minute um, conditioning session and saying things like get as many reps as possible communicates something very differently than, hey, I want you at an RPE of five to six where all throughout that 20 minutes I could come up to you and we could have a, a one or two sentence conversation. That's the level of difficulty that you're uh, going at. Sometimes you can take any type of language around uh, AMRAP and just replace it with quality. Hey, we're going 20 minutes for quality. That communicates something drastically different than three, two, one, go. And, and I think three, two, one, go is used uh, probably more than it should be. And we'll get into that in just a sec. Um, as far as strength training goes, there's something called uh, reps in reserve. If RPE is for um, subjective evaluation of intensity during longer aerobic sessions, reps in reserve is a very objective way to say, hey, this says uh, three by 12 repetitions, but I want you to have three reps in reserve when you finish this set of 12. Three is a very objective number, and I want you to only be able to do three more, which means that set isn't to failure. If you have a reps in reserve of zero, hey, that communicates that you want that person to go as challenging as they can, but without failing. It wasn't reps in reserve of negative one. Um, heart rate is a great correlation. We've done that in the past as well. Not advocating that everybody has to have a, a, an expensive um, smartwatch, but these very, very basic methods of tying some type of metric into intensity versus just unbridled um, speed as long as they can sustain it. Um, and this is where also percentage-based training um, can be very valuable. Now, for a long time, we only thought of percentage-based training as this uh, reference chart of, of preloquence chart in ways that, that we could just correlate absolute maxes to what we should be doing for three and five reps. But I think the smartest way to use correlation is to tie it back to some previous um, effort that you've already done. This takes me into uh, another category. And this, this one's going to take a little bit more planning. But to actually plan for benchmarks, um, if you look at periodized methods of training, 
they typically have certain things within uh, a six week to 12 week period that they're actually training for. This is the way that we program now. For every quarter, we come up with these things that we wanna prioritize and we test them initially. And so if you do something like the, the Cooper's test, which is a 12 minute um, max distance run test, there are tried and true progressions for that where you can take percentages of your effort and that becomes the way that you train. And using your own performance as what you'll base your percentage efforts on is a great way to control for intensity. And also back to the reason that we're doing this in the first place to make people feel really successful. When you're comparing uh, someone to an absolute, it's very easy to not feel motivated to keep going because every time you train, you're, uh, you're reminded about how short you are of this absolute. But when it's you based off of you becomes a very different paradigm. Another way to think about programming in general is to throw out this notion that we program for the best and we scale for the rest. Back to the you know Amanda analogy, if two people are the only people that are doing this workout as prescribed, um, it calls into question if that's really the most efficient way to present that to people. Probably the more efficient way to present to people is to actually uh, figure out what you think the majority of people would be capable of doing and only uh, customize up for those that you know are, are capable of being there because whatever is written on the board is what the majority of people are going to gravitate towards because they want, once again, psychologically to feel successful. And so even just coming up with ways that you can present that differently at the whiteboard is a very easy way to instantly change um, the level of retention. And by retention, I mean adherence. And by adherence, I mean someone's motivation to show up and feel successful every day. And quite possibly to, to change the safety level. I can tell you after doing this for five years, uh, injuries aren't at an absolute zero, but we, we looked at and we controlled for this in this last year, and our injury rate is 0. .0003. And so it's not non-existent, but it's so low that we're flabbergasted, we're shocked if someone is doing something that potentially hurts themselves. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way that we're programming, that we're not presenting these movements where the potential for that is high. We're presenting movements that we know that they can be very successful with. One of the last things I'll say from a, a programming standpoint is that one of the ways that um, workouts that are always for time or always for max effort fall short is that we say that these things are different from an energy system standpoint. We say, oh, well, hey, check it out. You know, because this is 20 minutes, uh, it's way different than this workout that's 10 minutes. Or, hey, you know, this workout has these uh, couplets, but look at this one. It's like four different movements. But from an energy system standpoint, if you're telling somebody past three or four minutes to go as hard as they can, i.e. go for time, all the way up to 20 minutes, their body's going through a, a similar system of creating and using ATP. Now we could, we could form a committee and, and argue over that. But I think the point here is that it's more like uh, Zoolander's several looks, which claim to be different, but are really just the same thing. If you really want to change the programming, then you need to not only change the language, but you need to change the whole flow and system of how you deliver this. If you want to work out that's aerobic versus anaerobic, you have to really control for that. You have to, to put movements in there where it's impossible for someone to get out of breath. You have to put these qualifiers in there where it's very clear what it is that you're, you're going for 
and you have to over communicate almost everything that you do. The way that we program right now is quite typically two days a week that have to do with work capacity. And when I say work capacity, that's something that we would traditionally call high intensity, something where you're trying to generate as as high of a wattage, so to speak, as you can within the time frame that you're given. Two days a week, it's quite typically aerobic training. This is where we want to regulate what the heart's doing, what the lungs are doing, and have it within those parameters where from a, a physiological standpoint, it's more like zone two training. And in later episodes, we'll get into the specifics of that. But a couple of days a week, we set intervals, we set rest, we set all these parameters in a way where um, the cycle time is high, the impact is low, the duration is long, and there's adequate rest and prescribed pacing where it really is an aerobic workout. And then lastly, there's two days a week since we program six days a week where it is strength training. Now, what's cool is that I say that, and if a member's watching this, they wouldn't necessarily know that. They would know the essence and the feel, but there's so much language that you can use to make it seem to the consumer like it's a work capacity workout, when in reality, it's a strength training workout. The thing I'll leave you with before we move on to the next category, if I write a 12-minute AMRAP, that has four different movements of 12 to 15 reps that you're doing at a tempo of 30x1, and I need you to take 10 to 15 seconds as you transition from one to the other, is that any different than writing A1, A2, and B1, B2 in the form that Charles Poliquin did 15 years ago? I mean, the reality is, is that it's just semantics. So I want to leave you with the notion that even just writing this differently can increase your degree of influence and control over the type of uh, dose response that your athletes get versus just giving them the same look every single day with, you know, different stickers on the apple or different sizes of the apple. Now, whatever you choose to do, if you want to experiment with some of this stuff, you do, for the most part, want to over-communicate this because we're creatures of habit and we don't like any change. So if you are like us, that for 10 years you were doing things a certain way and you decided for one reason or another that you want to start to change, you want to start to expand, you have this neat little map and you want to go off of the reservation – it would probably be a good idea to communicate this to the clients that you're training or potentially by and large the gym that you're in charge of. And you say it like this, hey, for these reasons, we want to experiment with this. If those reasons you have are for the good of humanity and for the sustainability of their training, it's probably going to be hard to argue with. And then you don't tell them that you're going to do it in perpetuity. You just say, hey, and for you know the next several weeks, we're just going to experiment with this. And you finish with this, if your results improve, if you feel better because of some of these changes, then we want to have a conversation about potentially continuing to include these things in the product that we deliver you. And you got to remember that if the reason you're doing something is for someone's betterment and someone's good, initially they may react to that defensively, but long term, especially if they start to feel better, especially if they start to perform better, which is what the case has been for us, then it's going to take some time. Hell, there may even be some people that quit because they're not actually training to do this long term. They just want to feel as intense as they can. Then I still think that you're doing the right thing. All right. So that's the low hanging fruit. And as we go one level deeper, it's less about the, the container and some of the ingredients around the workout, and it's more about the person. So up to this point, we've really just tried to, to regulate intensity in these cutesy and different ways. But now moving forward, it becomes less about 
having this um, varied but homogenous program, and it goes into the actual individual differences that people have. And there's an old skit on Saturday Night Live with uh, Dan Aykroyd and Belushi, and they're in a, a place in Chicago slinging cheeseburgers. And the person comes to the counter, and he's like, hey, could I get a, could I get a grilled cheese sandwich? And he's like, all we have is cheeseburger. And he's like, okay, well, I guess I'll get a cheeseburger. And the next person comes up, and he's like, hey, you know, I'd really like a salad. He's like, cheeseburger. <laughs> and everybody that comes in, they try to ask for something different, and the response is cheeseburger. And if we're not careful, training people in a group can become like that. Even if, even if it's a little varied, it can feel like a, a, a cheeseburger every day. And as coaches, as fitness professionals, I think we need to be more like a uh, a made to order cook that that can deliver anything that you want based on what your needs and preferences are. Now, in order to do this, there are things that have to happen on the front end. Uh, someone can't just hop into a group class off the street. Uh, there's just no way that you can understand what it is that they want. You can understand the essence of who they are. You do have to have these certain checkpoints that aren't to make your life more complicated, but it's just to get to know the person a little bit better. That's why there's things like an intake form. That's why uh, we do things like an assessment. It's not because we want to waste the athlete's time, and it's not because we want to bog the coach down with administrative work, but by having someone answer some very pointed questions about what it is that they're looking for, to see how they move, and then to start to try to, uh, for lack of a better word, profile them, to start to get a, a, a feel of what the essence of that person is, can start to create very drastic recipes that they might potentially need. For example, if you're a 22-year-old former college baseball player that has a job, but lots of flexibility in their schedule, and they just got into things like uh, the snatch, the muscle up, and they found that they have all the prerequisite strength for that. And their goals are to try to use fitness as a platform to compete. That looks like a very different recipe than someone who's 40 that's been doing this for 15 years that has three kids and lots of other residual um, allostatic load or life stress the recipes for those two people aren't just like, hey, scale it. it. It's potentially a completely different sequence of workouts. It's a potentially different volume. It's a different number of days in the gym. And by just gathering that information, you are so far ahead of the rest of the pack in understanding who this person is. And so from there, one of the things that we have based our whole business on since 2018 is placing uh, a coach in charge of a certain athlete. And so everyone that comes through the doors since 2018 is assigned to a point of contact. This is the person that's uh, primarily receiving their intake form, and it's the person that's taking them through an assessment. And it's the person that is getting to know the essence of who they are as an athlete and factoring in what their goals are. What's nice is that there's so many ways of working out. When we put the blinders on, we say, oh, I mean, there's only one way of doing something. And, you know, because I've gotten some results with high intensity, that must be the way that I have to continue to do it. And that's just flat out not true. It's not true because we can lift our head up and look around and see that there's lots of people getting results with lots of different methods. Now, could we argue that uh, intense-based training has the, the greatest level of potency? Yeah, I think you could, but we're not really talking about potency. We're talking about long-term development of an athlete. We're talking about retention so you can continue to work with somebody for a long, long time. And so if that's the game that we're playing, then pairing a coach with an athlete allows them to, to premeditate on what that person needs. And premeditation is always going to trump what happens at the whiteboard. The best in the biz may be able to see 25 people and make on the spot, shoot from the hip, accurate recommendations. 
for every person in that class. But me at my best at the whiteboard doesn't even compare to someone with a 16th of the experience that knows that person that is spending three minutes before the week starts thinking, you know what, I, I think I think Jennifer really should come to these sessions and here's a few things that I'm going to tweak because I know that her goals aren't necessarily to do a certain type of movement, but it's just to feel good. She's a night nurse. I know that her sleep is out of whack. I don't actually want to introduce anything that's super intense because I know that she's already got a, a full plate. And so I'm going to make sure that she comes on these days that are primarily aerobic. I'm going to do that because I know that she'll feel successful. I know that there won't be any movement patterns that she won't be able to navigate. And so by just simply recommending that the person comes on certain days, you're already customizing the, the micro cycle, the week of training that that person is able to execute. Now from there, by partnering athletes with a coach, there's already an open dialogue about what they're experiencing, what's missing, and what we can continue to iterate. Because even with an intake and assessment and starting to pool and profile these athletes into certain avatars of, okay, yeah, this is that this is that 22-year-old competitive guy that can handle a lot of stress. Okay, here's that 40-year-old guy with three kids that's been doing this for 15 years that can't handle as much stress. And beyond that, you're able to hear the feedback that they're giving you on the things that you're giving them, and you can continue to iterate. So it's this flywheel that continues to go around and gets better and even more customized and even more, dare I say, um, bespoke without having to remove them from any group experience. And that, if we stopped right there, would be revolutionary. It would be an amazing way to take this thing that feels homogenous and by just adding a little bit of individual attention, you've created this, this product that is way more sustainable because you have a human being that's just factoring in the fact that this individual has some things that potentially might not be like everyone else. That thing alone has drastically changed the results that people get here. It's drastically changed the uh, length of engagement or how long someone's been a member. And it's drastically changed uh, their, their motivation and how excited they are to train because they know that it's something that they'll feel successful with. It also, and this is a segue that we'll talk about another time, it also makes it very easy to have a conversation about what's missing. Because the reality is, is that every time that you do put people in a group, whatever that, whatever that template is, whatever that initial workout that you said, hey, this is what the majority will do, there's limitations there. You can't change every little thing and make every person happy. But if that's really clear that the workout has limitations in what it can do, then it makes it very easy to have conversations about how someone may want extra credit, how someone may want to take that um, basic program, and it is, it's just basic GPP, and then go into something more specific to train for something that has very technical requirements or, uh, hey, to be quite honest, a lot of people want to train for things that you need to go longer than a 60-minute class increment to do. The fact that we have that relationship, it makes it very easy uh, to have a conversation about how we might do more for them. And from a business lens, that means that it's very easy. We have 30, 40% of people that have upgraded into a, a top tier membership, which means that instead of having this uh, workout that's programmed for the best and everyone else kind of figures out what to do with it, that makes it seem like they're getting the best product possible, and so there's nothing else that you need. But when you're very clear that, hey, this is, the, this is the middle version that we could come up with, and there's people that wanna do more, it's an easy conversation to have around why that would be outside the confines of what they're paying for. Now, last point, in 2003, I was a biomedical science major at Texas A&M, and you wouldn't even call it a, an internship, but I got to be a student observer 
at the Nedham Steed uh, Laboratory, which is basically where all of the student athletes trained. Mike Clark, who's a legend in strength conditioning, I think he works for either the Chiefs or the Lions right now as their head strength coach. It was his last year as the strength coach there. And Nedham Steed, just to paint a picture, had been around since 1985. You would walk in there, concrete walls, and it would smell like there had been 18 years of sweat in there every day. I don't think no matter what cleaning product they had, you couldn't get, you couldn't get that smell out. Uh, they had the kind of turf that if you put your knee on there and you, and you move just a little bit, it'd like make your knee bleed. It was like the original AstroTurf. And it was this amazing experience for me because I never, I never played organized sports, much less seen how people at a very high level train for them. And what I saw was this. I saw that a, a group of very different profiles of human beings, 300-pound linemen, right next to 185-pound defensive backs, could all be in the same group together. And what it looked like, and I, I'm sure that it's very similar to this today in great places, is that there was a general warm-up where everyone participated. And then because they were so different and because their jobs were so different, they had certain portions of the hour where it was truly individualized. That means every avatar that was a 300-pound lineman did different drills, different skills, different strength movements, different flexibility positions that would really speak to the essence of who they were. But all throughout the hour, they would come back together and there would be things that they would do uh, corporately. It would be things that they would do that no matter who they were or what size they were, it was all the same. And I had the great fortune of asking Coach Clark why that was. And he said that we sit around as a group of coaches and we first think, what does the athlete need? And we think about this on an individual basis. From there, we figure out how we can keep them together to maintain the team atmosphere. And I'll leave you with that, that maybe the, the frontier of this is to appreciate that we want both. Appreciate that we want to maintain this group but that we're not trying to we're not trying to fit people into this certain mold. We're not trying to fit people into a certain mold with workouts, with uh, format. But we're we're sitting around like a bunch of coaches and thinking about what this person needs and how to keep them safe, and then from there figuring out a way that we can continue to do this together. I hope that this has been encouraging. I hope that it's been expansive versus uh, felt like a, a slam on anything because that's obviously not the point. This thing that we're talking about, I obviously love. I think it's uh, changed my life. And all of this came from a place of how could I continue to do this with people for the rest of their life versus like a one-year period. If you have questions about this, please reach out. Our Instagram handle is bpr.institute. And this is the first of many conversations we'll have around how to create radical health, this multidimensional model, and, and radical design for the athlete. Please subscribe. Thank you. And we're out.